Welcome to the Baptist Broadcast. Thank you for tuning in. iTunes, Spotify, you can find us on all those places. The Baptist Broadcast is being piped through anchor.fm and they are hosting also into or pumping us out into iTunes and Spotify and then some other platforms. But um, if you're watching on YouTube, please don't forget to click the subscribe button down below that big red button and click the bell for continued notifications. And before I actually start talking about what we're going to talk about today, please don't forget to visit the newsletter, joshsummer.substack.com. That is a good way to support this video content that you enjoy, if indeed you enjoy it. Tradcons and tradcats. Traditionalism is making uh, a resurgence. In the temporary or the near term, it's it's a good thing. In the long term, it's not. And, and it's only good if you assume that some measure of pragmatism can pay off in the short term, which it, it can in terms of civil good and, you know, in terms of the renewal of maybe some laws that are conducive to human society and things of that nature. So, you know, to that extent, you, you might be able to say, well, this is a positive step. This is better than the alternative liberalism, relativism. Although, you know, when you're looking at traditionalism, it's actually just relativism uh, cloaked in old garb. Uh, and it, it's relativistic because uh, the way that traditionalists uh, ground their beliefs is in tradition. And it's, it's tradition as a concept or as a genus is just kind of taken as a, an arbitrary fundamental base in which you ground all of your beliefs and practices. And that arbitrariness is what I'm referring to as, as relativism. So my, my contention here is that, okay, first of all, let me, let me clear the air. The, the elephant in the room is whether or not I think traditions are bad. No, there are good traditions, there are bad traditions. Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about good traditions, uh, Christian tradition, right? Uh, Christian tradition, in as far as it's, it, it comes out of the scriptures, is good tradition, right? So there's nothing wrong with tradition in say that is tradition in and of itself it's when we get to tradition in subiecto or how it's considered as a subject that becomes the problem how how different people view tradition where they place it whether or not they place it as as kind of something that is an effect of of knowledge or a, an operation of the intellect or whether or not they place it as a ground for the intellect those that, that's basically the two you know the two the, the two sides here, at least my side, I, I'm saying, you know, that tradition is good in as far as it, as it comes from the operation of the intellect, in as far as that practice, traditional practice, comes out of knowledge rather than traditional practice grounding our knowledge and our beliefs. So in other words, we believe something to be true and good and beautiful just because it's traditional, right? And that's bad. That's wrong. Um, because something isn't good, true, and beautiful just because it's a tradition. There are all sorts of bad traditions out there. So uh, we, need to, we need to be careful about how we understand tradition, where we place it in the order of our knowing. And um, uh, so let me give an example of some bad traditions. Um, and, and let me address specifically, I don't want to address Roman Catholics at this point in time, but we'll look at the trad cats here in a moment. Um, a, a bad tradition, as far as Protestants would would relate to it, would be uh, something like transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is very traditional. Transubstantiation is the tradition, a specific a specific traditional understanding of the Lord's Supper, and it uh, it holds that the the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. Uh, transfigures, uh, or not transfigures, but um, uh, transubstantiates, rather, into the carnal body and blood of Christ. And um, uh, Protestants have historically rejected that. In fact, they, they unanimously reject it to this very day. Uh, it's rejected in all, of the, uh, in all of the confessional literature. And um, 
and in all of the in all of the uh, treatises and uh, systematic theologies and things of that nature coming out of the Reformation and the post Reformation era. And uh, so that's one tradition that we would say is a bad tradition, and we don't nobody you know in the in the Protestant realm this resurgence of you know uh, traditionalism you know nobody that as far as I'm concerned, that holds to traditionalism, that tradition is a good in and of itself, um, without any sort of antecedent ground or, or expla- explanation preceding it, um, nobody would say that transubstantiation is a good thing, is a good tradition. They would reject it because it conflicts with their understanding of the scriptures, and they would rightly reject it, which means that there has to be something other than tradition by itself guiding and determining what kinds of decisions you're making in terms of what you what you believe. Um, it can't just be tradition, because if it was just tradition, you would believe something like transubstantiation. Why not, you know, believe in uh, the validity of, of Hinduism uh, to, to one extent or another? Because, you know, Hinduism is, is traditionally very old. It's very old. Um, and it's a, it's a rich tradition. Right, and so uh, it, th- there has to be something other than tradition, something more fundamental to tradition that um, helps us to understand which traditions are good and which traditions are bad. And that I would I, I would I would argue is actually theology. And um, um, one of the ways we can we can think of this is is how is in the same way I think that that Thomas. Aquinas answered uh, a question, answered an objection uh, to this question. The question is whether human law binds a man in conscience. And of course, he lists out three objections, and and these objections are are denying that human law can bind conscience in any sense. And the second objection reads thus, Further, the judgment of conscience depends chiefly on the commandments of God but sometimes God's commandments are made void by human laws. In other words, human laws, uh, you know, rend asunder the law of God, or they deny the law of God, or they reject the law of God. And then he quotes Matthew fifteen six: "You have made void the commandment of God for your tradition." Jesus says. Therefore, human law does not bind a man in conscience. Now, Thomas makes a, a in answering this objection makes a, a salient point and he and he makes a qualification while he's at it. In reply in response to objection two, he says, This argument is true of laws that are contrary to the commandments of God. So in other words, traditions or man made laws that are contrary to the to the commandments of God ought to be rejected, which makes the commandments of God, which we see in the scriptures, or even in natural law to some extent makes those commandments more basic, more fundamental than tradition, okay? There's, there's something that tradition has to be grounded in. There's some source of knowledge, there's some revelation that tradition has to be grounded in. So he says, this argument is true of laws that are contrary to the commandments of God, which is beyond the scope of human power. Wherefore, in such matters, human law should not be obeyed. So if human law goes against theology, true theology, then those human laws ought to be rejected. Thomas is actually setting precedent here for the the same sentiment that that came to a head during the time of the Reformation in the 16th century, really represented by men like Luther and Zwingli and others, and Calvin as well, Um, that these are... The, what we've gotten ourselves into, you know, uh, is human law that contradicts God's law. And so that human law has to be jettisoned. It has to be disobeyed in order that we might go on to better obey and adhere to God's law. So that makes God's word more fundamental than tradition. This means... At the, at the bare minimum, it means that there must be uh, something more fundamental than tradition, but it also means that tradition requires an explanation. Tradition requires an explanation. If tradition does not require an, ex- an explanation, then any and every tradition is justifiable. Everything is possible. So in, in, this, in this resurgence of traditionalism, 
and 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 the same is true for both Protestants and Catholics, kind of rushing to this traditionalism. Um, they're doing so by rejecting, or in the manner of rejecting, what's been historically termed the, the principle of sufficient reason, PSR for short. Um, and the pr- principle of sufficient reason just states that everything must have an explanation. Everything must have an explanation, and that thing's explanation is either in itself, uh, and the only thing like that is God, or it's in something else, right? Something that precedes it, something that's antecedent to it, something that's fundamental to it, or base, basic to it, a ground for it, we might say. And so the modern, the modern trad cat and trad con movements that exist in Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, respectively, are actually jettisoning a the principle of sufficient reason, which was adhered to rigorously by any of the men that recognize the traditions or practice the traditions that these trad cons and trad cats are trying to rush back to. And so they're they're putting the cart before the horse. In that regard, they're they're picking the tr- they're picking tr- traditions in a very consumeristic way, which is a very non-traditionalistic way. They're picking their traditions in a very consumeristic way. So they're they're looking at they're looking at traditions throughout time, which have you know borne some good fruit, and they're saying, "I want that tradition," or "I want this tradition." This tradition is what I'm going to choose to implement in my household. And raise my children according to, and this is a tradition that I'm going to practice, and and it actually ends up forming their theology instead of the other way around. That's a very non tradition, non traditional way of coming to tra- tra- to traditional knowledge. Um, so it's it's an irony. It's kind of a, a traditionalism is kind of a self refuting, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess approach to tradition, um, because the very way you go about choosing the tradition is very counter to uh, those you want to follow and adhere to within the tradition, the, you know, whatever tradition it is that you're choosing to, to align yourself with. Um, a better way is this. A better way of thinking about tradition is to think about tradition as an effect of something more basic than itself. And this is what the trad cats and the, and the trad cons, I think, are failing to understand. And they're just rushing to traditions as axioms because those traditions have produced good fruit in the past. So, we're, you know, they're expecting them to produce the same kind of fruit here in the future as if it's the tradition that bore the fruit and not the intellectual foundation, actually, that bore the fruit. See, tradition itself is the fruit, okay? Tradition is not an axiom that bears fruit. Tradition is the fruit, all right? Now you ask the question, the fruit of what? Well, when you look back at the tradition, at Christ, let's take, let's take the, the Christian intellectual tradition, for example, and you look at the men in that tradition, whether you're looking at the, at the uh, medieval scholastics, uh, you're looking at the reformers or the, the reformed scholastics, and you're, you're not seeing in their writings them looking back into the past and saying, this is a pretty good tradition. We're going to align ourselves with that tradition. They're not doing that. That's what Mennonites have done and the Amish have done. You know, they looked, they they picked a a specific period of time in history and they've tried to retain a lot of the accidental traits of that particular period of time, somewhat arbitrarily, I would add. Um, But, uh, but that's not the way that, that Christians have understood the placement of tradition. That's not the way that 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 Protestants have understood uh, have understood traditionally tradition. So, if you want to understand tradition, look back at how the tradition understood itself, and the the tradition understood itself very much so as as a, as a as an effect as a production of the intellect. Um, that is of the intellect uh, abstracting true things, true facts. Um, and so uh, what do I mean by that? Well, you don't, you don't see men, you know, Protestant scholastics, let's, let's take them as an example as kind of the height of reformed orthodoxy. You don't see them going back to the fifth century and saying like, we really like Augustine. Um, so we're going to do everything Augustine did and we're going to maintain all of his practices. No, actually they were, they were picking and choosing what they wanted from Augustine and what they didn't want from Augustine. The question is why, why were they doing that? 
because uh, and the re- the answer is they were comparing Augustine to something more fundamental than Augustine and anything Augustine wrote, namely the scriptures, mainly the scriptures, the inherent uh, the inerrant uh, inspired word of God, which has been understood as the source of knowledge, the principium cognoscendi uh, within Christian theology. So that was fundamental to the formation of traditions. So, so traditions were an effect of beliefs. They were an effect of beliefs that were, uh, that were uh, arrived at uh, through much intellectual rigor and work. Uh, and tiresome rigor and work at that. Um, You won't find talk in their corpus of literature of just going back to the tradition. Let's just go back to the tradition. Let's pick tradition out uh, and and use it as as a as a um, as a as a baseline kind of axiomatic uh, ground that we can that we can move off from and live our lives from. That's not how it was understood. Instead, what you have coming before it is theology, and then as a result of the operation of the intellect within the realm of theology, the queen of the sciences, you have tradition organically rising out of that. All right, so the, the, the traditions were not chosen from the past and just arbitrarily implemented in the, in the present. Tradition developed out of, out of the intellectual operation of the church in the past. Okay, so uh, so tradition was organically uh, being implemented, organically arising out of out of knowledge from knowledge from people coming to knowledge. Now, there's a a, a scriptural reason uh, f- for uh, you know what I'm saying, and I think Paul makes it very clear that a a, a zeal. We might align the term zeal, ardor and embracing, pursuing something, defending something like tradition. We might align that with tradition, right, in this, in this particular text. But if you look at Romans 10, 1 through 4, what you read is this. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, and, and in that you have all this man-made tradition that, that arose from that kind of an approach, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the fundamental. Christ is the basic. He's the, he's the, he's the properly basic axiom of, of the Christian's prax, practice, right? As, as he is revealed in the pages of Holy Writ. And so we don't want to be, as Christians, um, you know, and I, and I speak to, uh, uh, you know, Protestants, those who, those who believe in justification by faith alone, um, who believe in a true gospel, and make that distinction, uh, you know, from a distinction between them uh, and, the, and the tradcats, the uh, traditional Catholics. Um, we don't want to be... Uh, people who have a zeal for God without knowledge, right? Our zeal needs to, our tradition needs to arise out of our knowledge uh, organically, right? So uh, that's how you, you know, and that's and that's just kind of my uh, initial thoughts on the uh, on the on the tradcat and tradcon uh, movements. Um, tradcon is just more generic, right? You have non-Christian conservatives who are aligning themselves with more traditional conservative values. You have Protestants who are aligning themselves with more traditionalistic ways of thinking, even about their religious practice. Uh, and then you have the trad cats who are going back to Latin masses and things of that nature. And the question is why? Uh, and, and a lot of them will just answer because these traditions are good, true, and beautiful. Um, how do you know that, right? What's, what, is, what, are, what, what is the fundamental against which you you compare your traditions to ensure that they really are good, true, and beautiful. Um, you have to justify your assertion that these traditions that you're practicing, that you're going back to, are indeed good, true, and beautiful. Um, and so 
the question then becomes, you know, where, you know, what, what, uh, what source of knowledge, what is the, what is the source of knowledge that we compare these traditions to? And I would argue that the source of knowledge must be the Principium Cognoscendi, the Holy Scriptures, um, in terms of all, you know, uh, Christian theology, right? So, um, anyway, guys, if this was helpful, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell for continued notifications. Do not forget to visit the newsletter website. It's, it's down here, uh, down here. I, I don't even know how to, Right there, joshsummer.substack.com. Visit that. Again, it's a good way to get updates in your email, but you can also support uh, content like this through that. So God bless you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day.